Good morning. You're welcome here to worship at the Canton United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Clay. It is a delight to be together as a family of God this morning uh, to rejoice in the truth of our faith that Jesus is with us as we gather in his name today. This morning is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, and we are starting a new worship series uh, based on, again, kind of the same idea as the Bible study, but um, based on these ideas of the meal stories in the Gospels. The Gospels are full of stories of Jesus meeting people around meals, of Jesus eating meals with people that the world had written off, the world had cast off, and yet Jesus welcomed them. Um, I think about in my own life, the way that meals have been so transformative and so powerful, like not just the meals themselves, but the company that I kept at those meals. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in my office and I got an email from someone saying, hey, um, it's a, 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 a biblical counselor from Sioux Falls wanting to kind of get the word out about what she was doing. And she said, hey, can we meet together over a meal? And so we were able to do that, and we were able to, I mean, it was two perfect strangers meeting at a co caribou coffee for a, a cup of coffee and a bagel, um, but it was more than that because we were two people of faith uh, coming together to talk about the way that God had moved and worked in our lives to the point where we were doing what we were doing. Meals have that ability. They break down those barriers, and I think that they're such powerful stories for us to think about. So today we're talking about the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Uh, in the Gospels, there are all kinds of different stories, and some of those Gospels feature different stories from, uh, from the other Gospels, but the feeding of the 5,000 is the one story that is in all four of the Gospels. Only two stories have that distinction, one of them being the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the other one being the feeding of the 5,000. This story was so important to who Jesus was that every single one of the four gospel authors included this story. What can we learn about who Jesus is as Jesus feeds this multitude? What can we learn about, you know, the faithfulness of the disciples that believed that Jesus could do something when they said, we don't know what to do, can you do something? <laughs> they turned to Jesus and Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up to take care of the concerns of his disciples. Jesus showed up to take care of the concerns of the crowd. And Jesus shows up in our lives as well. And thanks be to God for that truth. As we come into worship this morning, let us hear our prelude from, Je from Jenna as we prepare our hearts for today.
Thanks, Jenna. As you are comfortable this morning, I invite you to stand for our responsive call to worship. It's on the first, uh, the left side of your uh, paper bulletin this morning. It'll also, for those worshiping online, be on the screen for you. I um, just invite you to respond. If you're responding from the bulletin, the bulleted t- text is yours. If you're responding from the screen, the larger yellow text is for you. Dear friends in Christ, we come today believing in our emptiness. We come today fearful of sharing. Fearful of losing our tenuous grip on security. Fearful of touching and knowing the pains of others. We come today overwhelmed by our hunger. Overwhelmed by the suffering of our world. Overwhelmed by senseless violence, grief, and death. We come aching from the weight of responsibility. Today we come longing for more. Jesus meets us here, and in him we experience a life of life. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is found in your smaller black hymnal, the Faith We Sing Supplement. We're going to be turning to page 2126 and singing together All Who Hunger. As we stand, let us join our spirits and voices together in our word of opening prayer. It's on your, uh, on your bulletin this morning. Together we pray. O oh God, as the crowds follow Jesus, eager to be filled with hope, we come to this place seeking the nourishment of our souls. Settle us down as Jesus seated the multitude. Calm us down as Jesus reassured the disciples that all will receive care. Lift us up as Jesus encouraged others to reach out in compassion. Give us hearts of confident faith in your presence, O Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're seated, we're going to turn to our United Methodist hymnal, the larger Navy hymnal in your hymnal racks. We're going to turn to page 384 and sing together, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, again on page 384.
loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for drawing us together here in this place and online and anywhere in between so that we may enter into your presence, so that we may, so that we may tune our hearts to sing your praises, so that we can say what needs to be said before you as an act of faith and a proclamation of trust. God, we put our faith in you, in who you are, in who you've shown yourself to be throughout the testimony of Scripture and in our own lives. God, we entrust to you the concerns of our hearts, the joy of our lives, the bewilderment and uncertainty we face. As an evidence of that trust, O oh God, we've even managed to say some things out loud. We do that because we know you hear us, you receive us, you love us. So we give you thanks for the gift of visitors. We give you thanks for healing. We give you thanks for people that are willing to give of their own time and energy and even safety to ensure safe passage on snowy roads. We give you thanks for the way that this faith community has formed community and a way in which we care for each other by giving rides, by helping out, by hearing your call in our lives and responding. And God, in trust, we cry to you for those who mourn, for those who wait, for test results, for meetings to happen, for ways forward to be made clear. We do all of this again as a proclamation of our faith in you, in who you are. And we recognize that a large part of who you are is made known to us by Jesus, who cared for everyone with whom he interacted during his time on earth, his disciples, the outcasts, even those that had lost their way. And as a proclamation of our faith, as a stake of our trust, we join our voices and pray in the prayer that Jesus used to teach his disciples how to pray in the first place. Saying, pray this way. This time I'm inviting our choir forward to present an anthem called Love the Lord Your God.
As the choir makes their way back to their seats, I want to invite our younger disciples forward for a time that's mostly just for the kids. Morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Did you enjoy your snow days followed by your days off from school if you go to school in Canton? Yeah, was it kind of nice to have a five-day weekend? Hey, what? Yeah, we went to the basketball game yesterday, didn't we? I saw you at the basketball game, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. So, I want to know today, what is your favorite food? Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. That seems to be a pretty good consensus in our house, too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Who else has a favorite food? What's that? Orange chicken. That's a good one. Nice. Your favorite food is called pizza? I think I've heard of that before. Yeah. What do you think, Everett? Watermelon. That's a great favorite food. What's your favorite food, dude? Watermelon also? Yeah, I figured that was coming. Avenel. Egg wraps. Okay, cool. Hey, no thank you. What's your favorite food? Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Yes, I know your favorite, my favorite food is mac and cheese. Your favorite food is watermelon too? Nice. That's a great variety. If we went to a potluck together, we'd have a pretty good time, wouldn't we? We got to have a little bit of everything. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So I want to know what would happen if someday we came to you and said, here's your favorite food, but in only order for you to get it, you have to share it with everybody else that's there. Are you willing to share your favorite food? Yeah? With a big group of people? Yeah, well, like, like a whole bunch of my cousins. Yeah, with a whole bunch of your cousins. There's quite a few in that crew, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what would you be concerned about? If you had to share your favorite food with a bunch of people, what would be your biggest concern be? I'm not going to touch that one. That can get handled in the back row. There may be some dissension among the uh, Stearns cousins. Um, what's your concern if you, if you have to share your favorite food with everybody in a big group of people? Not enough food, right? Am I going to get as much as I want if I have to share with you, right? That's my concern too because I have a favorite food called steak and I'm not a very good sharer when it comes to steak. Uh, hi, yeah. I mean, I'll share if I have to, but it's not my favorite thing to do. So in our scripture today, Jesus and his disciples are not eating their favorite food. They're eating the food that they have. And what they have is five loaves of bread and two fish. But here's the problem. There's a crowd of 5,000 people. Do you know how big Canton is? about 3,000. So about a one and a half cantons, and all they have is five loaves of bread and two loaves of fish. What do you think that they're going to be concerned about? Not enough food, right? What makes the difference? Jesus. They're willing to share because Jesus is with them. And sometimes it's hard for us to share, and it's hard to, for us to, to, to think about the idea of having enough, but yet Jesus asks us to do it anyway. And so what, is good, uh, 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 what we need to do as, as Jesus followers is to share, even if it's our favorite food or even if it's, you know, something that, that isn't quite our favorite food, but we have some of, we, care, we are still called to share that. Um, Jesus sees that, and Jesus has a way of making that be enough for us, and we just give thanks to God for that reality. So let's have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to share my candy basket with you, and I know that there's enough over there. Let's pray. I'll say a phrase and everybody repeat it after me. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for our favorite foods and those who cook it for us. Help us to always be willing to share when you ask. We love you. In your name we pray.
Amen. Amen. All right, you can head to the retreat basket. There is enough for everybody to have a treat. Our scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 14. I'll be reading verses 13 through 21. This is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 people. Um, And invite you to page 21 of your pew Bibles to follow along with today's reading as I read from the Good News Translation. When Jesus heard the news about John, the news that John the Baptist had died, he left there in a boat and went to a lonely place by himself. The people heard about it, and so they left their towns and followed him by land. Jesus got out of the boat, and when he saw the large crowd, his heart was filled with pity for them, and he healed their sick. That evening, his disciples came to him and said, It is already very late, and this is a lonely place. Send the people away and let them go to the villages to buy food for themselves. Jesus answered, They don't have to leave. You yourselves give them something to eat. They replied, All we have here are five loaves and two fish. Then bring them here to me, Jesus said. He ordered the people to sit down on the grass, and they took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and gave thanks to God. He broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Everyone ate and had enough. Then the disciples took up twelve baskets full of what was left over. The number of men who ate was about five thousand, not counting the women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you. For you, O God, are our rock, and you are our Redeemer. And we give you thanks for who you are as we say together, Amen. So what I'm about to say might come as a surprise to you, but I love church camp. I'll give you a second to recover from your shock. That being said, there is nothing scarier for me than the first few hours of church camp. It is nerve-wracking for deans and for counselors and can even be scary for campers, too. There is no dread like standing in front of 25 to 50 middle schoolers and saying, Welcome to camp. I hope this is the best week of your summer. I hope you meet Jesus in an entirely different way. And also, I am so excited for all that this week has to offer you. I can look confident and I can look like I'm having fun doing that in front of a group of middle schoolers, but in the back of my head, it's just spinning. Are they going to like this game? Is this game going to work? Is it going to rain? What do we need to do if it does start to rain? Just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. All the while we're playing get-to-know-you games and reviewing the boundaries of camp so that everyone has fun. We're doing that work of setting expectations so the whole week supposedly runs smoothly. Then the first meal comes. Then campers settle into little groups that likely will not change unless a mean camp dean makes them move every once in a while. And yes, I am a mean camp dean. The counselors intersperse themselves among the group, and all of a sudden, the din of a group getting to know each other overtakes the room. As stressful as those first few hours then, as those first few hours are, it is completely rewarded by that sound. There is no sound quite like a group of people getting to know each other around a meal. In their book, Meeting Jesus at the Table, Cynthia Campbell and Kirstine Coy Four point out that meals are not calories needed to sustain life. Meals are not just calories, consuming the calories needed to sustain life. Food is meant to be shared. Meals bring people together and meals help form relationships. Food at camp is important. There is so much activity and so much excitement, and food is what fuels that excitement. 
But mealtimes are more than just the food we eat. Mealtimes are the relationships that we build around those tables. It's my feeling as a planner of camp that mealtimes are just as important as games. Mealtimes are just as important as worship. Mealtimes are just as important as campfires and songs, and mealtimes are just as important as s'mores. All of those essentials of church camp. As I was thinking about today's scripture, I was feeling that same nerve-wracking energy in the story as I feel at the start of church camp. This scripture has that same kind of frantic energy behind it. Because at the start of the scripture, or even really before the scripture, Jesus receives this tragic news that his cousin and co-conspirator in the gospel, John the Baptist, has been beheaded by Herod. And he responds, as we all might, by wanting to get away, by retreating to the wilderness. The problem is, is that his popularity has grown to the point where wilderness and solitude are a rare commodity. Jesus and the twelve retreat to a hillside in Galilee so that Jesus can process through his emotions, so that Jesus can pray to God, and so that Jesus can mourn the death of his cousin. But the crowds follow. The crowds form. The crowds bring their sick before Jesus. And rather than be annoyed at this major inconvenience, Jesus has pity, has compassion. Jesus heals those in the crowd. And there had to have been a lot of them because we're told that Jesus is involved and active in this story, in this healing, until it is time for dinner. At which point the disciples come to Jesus with a reasonable request. Given the time of day and and their remote location, the disciples come to Jesus and say, send this crowd away. Let them go get some food. Let us let us go get some food. That's been enough for today. The disciples come to Jesus with a reasonable request, but are given an unreasonable responsibility. Because Jesus responds to them by saying, you go give them something to eat. If you're so worried about it, you do it. You go give them something to eat. Come again now? In the minds of the disciples, it has likely been a long day. And the disciples are feeling a mix of their own hunger. And they're feeling a compassion for Jesus, who has to still be reeling from the news of the death of his cousin. And they have to be feeling some kind of concern for the physical needs of the crowd. Quite frankly, it's time for all of them to eat something. And finding something for everyone to eat for these 12 disciples is going to not only be daunting, but also bleed into the area of impossible. The disciples come to Jesus with a reasonable request and are given an unreasonable responsibility. All that they've been able to scrounge together, whether from the supply of a little boy or a supply of their own, is five loaves and two fish. And they're not, you know, pointing out the obvious to say that that's not enough. That's not enough for the crowd, and that's barely enough for the 13 of them, 12 disciples plus Jesus. Yet Jesus' command remains. You give them something to eat. Talk about nerve-wracking and stressful. Imagine those poor disciples having to stand in front of a crowd of 5,000 people and say, Welcome to the hillside. You've met Jesus in an impossibly um, powerful way. Now watch as we try our best. 
The disciples get that they can't do this. The disciples know their limitations amid the immensity of what Jesus has asked them to do. They know that they can't do it on their own, and so they turn to the one who can. They turn to Jesus. And Jesus took what they had and looks to heaven and blesses God and then gives the bread and the fish back to his disciples and sends them back among the crowds one more time. When Jesus said, you give them something to eat, Jesus meant it. In Jesus' hands and with God's blessing, these meager rations feed the entire multitude. And the disciples are even able to collect leftovers. As the supply that they had came and came and came, as the meal distributed, as the meal was distributed, everyone ate their fill. It wasn't just a light snack, it was a full filling meal. And I'm sure that the anxiety levels of the disciples lowered, that their stress subsided. And that the sound of a group of people getting to know each other around a meal filled the air. In this meal story of Jesus, in this blessing of bread and sharing of fish, we meet the compassion and the command of Jesus. On a day when Jesus wanted nothing more than to break away and be alone with his grief, he saw a large crowd and had compassion. The miracle that Jesus performed demonstrated that Jesus' compassion extends to all of of what makes us who we are. That Jesus' compassion extends to our physical needs. Jesus is not just concerned about our spiritual health, which he addresses through his teaching. Jesus is also willing to look out for the total well-being of all people. When we find ourselves in need of healing, when we find ourselves facing what we think are reasonable requests and get in response unreasonable responsibility, we can turn to a Jesus who cares. When we come to Jesus, Jesus meets us. And we meet someone who cares, who heals, and who nourishes mind, body, and spirit. And just as it was then, so it is now, and so shall it be. This is who Jesus is. Jesus cares for all of who we are. But do you see the limitation? Jesus is but one person. And there's a big crowd and a lot of work to do. So I like the way that Doc Hollingsworth puts it in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. I also like saying the name Doc Hollingsworth. Most Bibles title this reading, Jesus Feeds the 5,000. Actually, Jesus feeds the disciples who then feed the 5,000. And clearly this miracle is the work of Jesus feeding the multitude, but it does not reduce the call of the disciples to passive piety. Our call is to activate ministry. Our call is to meet human needs. It is Jesus who feeds the twelve, and it's the twelve that feed the five thousand. Jesus commanded the disciples to do something hard. Jesus commanded the disciples to do something that bordered on impossible. And then gave them what they needed in order to make it happen. You give them something to eat, Jesus said. And Jesus provided something and inspired the disciples to share freely. During this Lenten season, it is my hope that we encounter the compassion of Jesus and that it allows us to engage fully in this season and to celebrate completely the resurrection. But it's also my hope that we will hear and heed the call of Jesus asking us to do hard things. Jesus acted through the disciples and continues to do so to this day. 
We are the disciples of Jesus Christ who have been called forth to extend compassion and invite others to the table. And no matter how stressful that is, no matter how nerve-wracking that is, no matter how exhilarating and exciting that is, Jesus' command remains. And Jesus will give us what we need in order to do what Jesus has called us to do with leftovers included. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Loving Jesus, we give you thanks for the way that you showed up in the lives of your disciples. And on this day, we simply ask that you would do the same for us. As you called them to do hard things, we know you have called us to do hard things. And give us the courage and the confidence to respond in kind. Jesus, extend your compassion into our lives where we need it. And just show us your way. Show us how you've called us to serve. And when that feels daunting, show us how you're willing to help. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to use as our words of institution an invitation to the table that's on your bulletin this morning and just invite you to respond uh, with that, with the bolded text as you did before. If you're online, uh, respond with the, with the yellow text that will be on the screen. Dear friends in Christ, we put our trust in Jesus Christ who said, I am the bread of life. We are fed by the body of Christ and by the word of God. We are nourished and sustained by God's life-giving spirit. We receive Christ's promise to fill our hunger and quench our thirst. Christ gives life to the world through his broken body. And Christ gives life to the world through his spilled blood. Come to the ta table to receive him with joy. Christ is our living bread. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks for these gifts of bread and cup. And we ask that you would make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, redeemed by his blood, so that we may be his people in the world. By your spirit, O God, make us one. One with all who commune at this table. One with all that are uh, in, in the ministries that we engage in. One with all in the world so that all may know your love and your care and your provision. And using the words that Jesus would have prayed on that day on that hillside in Galilee, so now we pray. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, our God and King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Holy God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go forth into the world in the strength of this meal to give ourselves for others. God, we give you thanks for the way that you've shown up in our lives and so inspire us to show up for others. In your name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is found in your United Methodist hymnal. We're going to stand as we are comfortable and sing together the first three verses of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. I'll give us the benediction, and we'll sing verse four of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Again, the larger Navy hymnal in your hymnal racks on page 557. Let us sing together this morning.
Dear friends in Christ, you have been fed with the bread of heaven and blessed by the presence and peace of God. And now go into the world in peace, in the peace of Christ, to be bread for the world. Amen. Let us bring worship to a close by singing verse 4 of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. <laughs>